Which are the key responsibilities covered by the Chief Compliance Officer role? What qualification and experience are required to apply or how will the Chief Compliance Officer of the future look like? All these and much more in our one-on-one discussion today with Baptist Forrester. So here is our one-on-one interview and I hope it will help you to learn more about the Chief Compliance Officer role. Hi, Baptiste. Welcome to FinCram Agent. Uh, how are you today? I'm good. Thank you for having me, Marco. It's a pleasure. It's a great pleasure to have you on this channel and I look forward to our interview. I think it's going to be extremely interesting for our viewers to get an understanding about the Chief Compliance Officer role and uh, to get more uh, insight from uh, your experience. So maybe we can start by sharing with the viewers your professional background and uh, let us know a bit more about what you're up to in these days. Yeah, sure thing. So uh, I've been working in the compliance industry for a little bit less than eight years now, um, always in startups. So uh, I started at uh, Limonway, which is an e-money institution specialized in marketplaces and crowdfunding platforms. So there I, I learned a lot of things. I did internal control, I did KYC, integrating an OCR tool, um, I did also some AML, uh, doing the setup of the transaction monitoring tools and so on. So I, I learned a lot uh, working within this regulated uh, entity. Then uh, I moved to Spendesk, which is uh, one of the latest uh, fintech unicorn in France. So uh, it's a spend management platform. So there I arrived quite early in the company and I had the chance to build all the compliance department from the ground up. So it was a very, uh, very interesting uh, experience. And uh, before leaving uh, for this new adventure that I'm working at at the moment, I had also, I would say, the chance to work on this project to acquire a banking, uh, like an e-money institution license for Spender. So I had to work with the French regulator, provide all the necessary policies and prove that the company was able to also uh, work in this heavily regulated environment. And now uh, I'm working at the third company of my uh, not so long career, which is called Linksy. So it's L-E-N-K-C-Y and it's a banking as a service or embedded finance platform. So what we do is that uh, we have partners and these partners, they want to provide payment services to their end users. But it takes very long if you want to do it by yourself because you have to build the core banking system, you have to develop a lot of features yourself, and you also have to get, to go get uh, some kind of uh, regulation, uh, like a, uh, at the very least become an agent of an immune institution. And it also takes very long. It's a month, sometimes a year of project. So we do that for them and they just have to basically integrate our API and with it, they can create cards, accounts, make transfers. And um, it's like uh, like Lego, you know, Lego, the, the, you just have building blocks. And with it, you can create a B2B new bank or you can create a service to uh, give salary advance to your employees. Whatever you can create with accounts and cards, you can do it with us. So soon, we will also uh, provide our partners with a, with a white label solution that will enable them to add crypto wallets and crypto transfers and swaps and so on uh, within their own uh, product, with their, their own offers. So this is what I'm doing, like a, I would say, as, a, as an employee. Uh, and on the side, uh, I also started uh, since uh, last year to give classes. Uh, so I, I give classes in the master's degree specialized in um, anti-fraud uh, prevention. And soon I'm going to start the same thing uh, in a low degree. Uh, and this one is specialized in uh, financial crimes. Very interesting. Very interesting. I, I, I would like to attend one of your classes when they, if they, are they all in France? Yeah, they're, they're all in France and I'm afraid in French. However, uh, okay. I forgot to say, but um, I also did uh, a few videos for a learning platform which is based in India. Right. Uh, it's called Fintelect. 
and uh, they're in English. So, uh, for example, if you want to learn about banking as a service and the compliance which is related to it, you can have a look. And I, I believe the, this video is free on the platform. So uh, this one you can check whenever you want. Amazing. I will definitely do that. Um, moving on with our interviews, the um, Chief Compliance Officer role is uh, a key position that uh, is supporting the MLROs in shaping and very often tuning the compliance program that is in place by firms. What in your view constitute an effective compliance program? That's a, that's a very good question and that's something that uh, I feel confident answering now but uh, it took me quite some time to actually process all of this and uh, i would say to me uh, there are three pillars uh, and the first one is the regulation you, you need to be able to really properly understand what are the requirements that you have to implement it's very important uh, and just also to always keep uh, keep in touch with uh, the, the new uh, regulations and so on so first you do that then when you really understand what you have to do, you go to the tools and the processes. So you need to really build the best processes possible to make sure that it's as smooth uh, and it doesn't create uh, friction for the business side of things because it's always something you have to keep in mind, of course. And the third pillar, uh, to me, might be the, the most important one, is the is the people. Because first you understand the regulation, then you build the processes. But afterward, you need to have the right people to actually implement these processes and use the tools uh, in an efficient way. So training and uh, hiring the right person for the right job is also very important. So uh, you, you cannot disregard any of these pillars because if you uh, fail at in even one of them, then your whole uh, framework will be faulty. Definitely. Failing in one of these pillars will, of course, impact uh, immediately all the other pillars that you mentioned. And uh, yes, thank you for sharing your view on that. I'm often very curious about the evolution of things uh, in general. So the role that you are covering at the moment, I think is also going to change uh, with, with, with time. and. What do you think is going to change from the uh, chief compliance officer that is run today with the role of the C um, CEO of tomorrow? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's de definitely, I think, uh, one of the jobs which, which is changing the most in the last few years. Uh, I'm not that old, and when I started um, uh, doing KYC, um, you know these lines at the bottom of the passport and the, in the IDs, in the MRZ lines. Um, my job was basically to type these lines in a small, uh, small software, something like that, and it was calculating if it was real lines or not. So it was like a, a first check to make sure that it was not like a falsified uh, fake IDs. So that was the first thing, and then. Uh, visually, we were like checking the, the because I always work within startups, so it was always digital. Uh, I never had like face to face onboardings. So uh, we were checking the documents and we were trying to see if the uh, ID had been tampered with, if something was missing or something like that. So he was, uh, let's be honest, he was not very efficient and a good fraudster, he could fool us uh, any day. Uh, and now when I see the tools I have in hand, I think one of the answer to your question is, uh, we are no augmented compliance uh, officers because uh, there is always this gut feeling that it is important. Uh, we, we do investigations, we need to have like this, uh, uh, yeah, something in, in the gut really, but the tools we have now are so powerful. Like if you take the screening tools with this machine learning um, that allows you to uh, eliminate some false positives more efficiently over time. Uh, if you take this new, uh, all these registers that you can tap into uh, in a matter of seconds to verify who are the UBOs, who are the current directors, are they working within other companies or not? Uh, and also uh, I was mentioning the ID verification now. 
uh, with this, um, I think everyone is uh, is familiar with it. When you open a, an account with any new bank now, you have to uh, take a selfie. Uh, sometimes you even have to do like some video to just move your head, uh, say a sentence and something like that, which is called, uh, I'm sure you know that, but for your listeners, which is called um, uh, liveness detection. And to fool that, it, it's actually you, it's not like a like a typical fraudster. You need to be actually uh, like a like a doctor or something like that. You need to be very skilled, a lot of skills to be able to fool that. So I, I'm very impressed by the tools we have in hand now, uh, especially transaction monitoring too, uh, which is such a such a, an efficient way to monitor your your clients' activity. This is one part of the answer. I would say augmented uh, with all the tools. Other thing is uh, data mutualization. Uh, it's it's a slow process because it, it's starting with banks and you know how it is. They they, they move very slowly and they, they are afraid of change. But I think we are going in this direction of sharing all this data. And if someone detects a bad guy, then everyone benefits from it because in the end it's uh, it's in the, the benefit of the society uh, as a whole so uh, i think it's going to take a few more years before it's actually efficient and actionable but we are going in this direction and at some point we will i think globally share this uh, this information so uh, this is this definitely a great thing and um, i would say third thing and it's good for us as compliance professionals is the fact that um, fines are raining and they are getting bigger and bigger and the companies they understand that uh, the uh, compliance is not something that they just have to put on the side and say okay we have compliance department we don't put any energy into it because in the end they it, it costs them a lot of money so now they prefer to invest into our departments instead of like uh, getting these huge fines. So uh, we are getting more and more important in the decision making process and uh, within the, 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 the directions of the different companies. So I, I think it's a, it's a bright looking future for compliance uh, professionals. Thank you so much. That's uh, very interesting and uh, very useful. Um, in terms of the typical day of a chief compliance officer, how would that look like if, of course, such a thing as a typical day would exist? But if you can just give us an example for people that are trying to get into this role, um, just uh, for the flavor of a potential typical day. Yeah, so uh, as you said, there, there, there are no typical day. It's more, uh, I would say, phases. Uh, yes. And it really depends on the, the size of your company, how mature is it, and uh, the, the type of uh, uh, risks uh, you, you, you try to mitigate. So um, in my first company, I was mostly in project mode. So I was working a lot with the data and the um, engineering team uh, just to make sure that we were implementing uh, the, the tools the way I wanted them uh, to be and also to do some internal developments for, for, for use of my team. So it, it was a lot of uh, almost like a, as a product manager for the compliance department. I was like expressing my needs. I was making sure it was developed the right way. So I really enjoyed this, uh, the, these moments, by the way. Um, then at some point uh, when the I had all the tools I needed and it was more like a smooth sailing. Uh, it it uh, switched to actually being more uh, focused on managing because the team was growing and uh, the, the, the more it grows, the less you, you do. So uh, it's more management and uh, uh, of course, some uh, level two uh, checks just to make sure that uh, operationals are doing the job properly. But uh, it changes over time and then it's more about strategy and you, you um, interact more with the other directions just to make sure that uh, everything is uh, is working properly in between these, uh, these different departments. Um, and then also when you are a regulated entity, there is this phase that you have every year, you need to fill in all the official reports. Uh, so you it takes you 
from three to four months minimum. And then uh, it's actually quite interesting because you also need to interact with the data team to get all the information you need to fill these different reports. You also need to uh, check your uh, policies to make sure that they're still up to date with the current regulation. You need to have discussions with a lot of department heads just to make sure that they are also implementing the, the different policies in the right way. Um, and now uh, in my current company, which is very early stage startup, so we are 15, so it's a very small company compared to my previous uh, experiences. I am doing compliance, of course, lots of projects, but I'm also doing other things like uh, uh, helping a lot with hiring uh, outside of compliance for other roles. Uh, I'm helping to find uh, a new offices uh, for, for because we are growing quite, uh, quite fast. So um, definitely no typical day but uh, a very interesting variety of tasks that uh, I think for people that want to put their hands on uh, different aspects of the job, uh, it makes it very interesting and very stimulating because uh, I've never felt that I was not learning something while uh, doing my job. There is always something new to, to, to learn about and to be interested in. So it's, uh, it's quite a great job. Yeah, it does sound very interesting indeed. So for those uh, that are watching the video that are interested in, in the role, I can maybe summarize that to say that be prepared to build something, to remain updated and to get great responsibilities on your shoulder, especially when you are filing the reporting to the regulators and when you are in charge of building a, a solid structure for the organization that you are working for. So that takes me to the next question, Baptiste, which is uh, how you are actually um, remaining updated with, as a chief compliance officer with the huge volume of AML regulations that have been developed uh, throughout the globe or maybe more specific uh, for the jurisdictions where your firm is reporting. Yeah, so my, my luck is that uh, working within the uh, European Union, uh, it's kind of standardized. So uh, I don't need to keep uh, track of every country. I just need to keep track of the uh, this global uh, regulation. And uh, honestly, of course, when there is a new directive, it takes some time because you have to read it from a uh, beginning to uh, from end to end. So it's uh, it's quite a lengthy uh, read. But other than that, uh, honestly, I do two things. Uh, and uh, first thing is that I have a few Google alerts with uh, some right keywords uh, and sometimes it helps. But honestly, the most efficient way, uh, and I think you will concur with me, is actually LinkedIn. Uh, my professional network is mostly compliance professionals and honestly when there is a new article about something uh, that I need to know uh, it's more or less impossible for me to to, to miss it so uh, I would say LinkedIn is a great way to keep uh, to keep track of all the new regulations I actually agree since LinkedIn uh, started to become more and more important and you build your network around it, when something new comes up uh, across regulations or in the industry, you will see that it's not just one person possibly posting it, but there will be more and more. So even if you miss maybe an update from someone and uh, you, you still are o on that social network, you will eventually get an understanding of how the market is going or anything new that is happening. So I agree with you, it's a, it's a fantastic tool. And the, the next question I have for you is regarding the qualification and the, the any formal edu education that may be needed in order to cover the chief compliance officer role. And beside the qualification, what sort of background candidates should have in their CVs if they want to aim to get into the chief compliance officer role? Yeah, so... Um... When, when I started, and uh, I feel a bit old uh, when I say that, but uh, I'm, I'm not that old, I'm 30 something. But uh, anyway, it, it was, uh, there was no like dedicated studies for, um, for compliance. It, it was like people coming from low degrees or uh, finance studies, something like that. But no one had like a, like a specialized in anti-money laundering. It did not, did not exist or, or barely at the very least. 
uh, but now they are like uh, actual diplomas that train you for this new uh, for this new field which is ours uh, so of course this is a very good way to uh, to, to learn the job and to, to find your first uh, your, your first uh, your first job uh, at the company uh, and then if you want to get to uh, to be like head of compliance uh, within a company, uh, then you will have to do this extra mile. You will have to read about it. Like uh, you will have to, of course, check uh, and follow the uh, whatever is happening in the world, in the different regulations and so on. Uh, personally, uh, I took the uh, ACAMS uh, certification, which is uh, which is like very high level and it's very good when you want to work uh, at an international level. Um, and yeah, I think that, that, that's pretty much it. But really the thing is, um, and, and I think you, 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 you will concur with me, basically depending on the industry you are working in, it's very difficult at some point to move from, uh, let's say I'm working in the fintech industry, very digital. If I would like to go in the equity uh, side of things, for me, it would be very hard because they would tell me, okay, you know, 60, maybe 70% of the job, there is this 30% which are uh, about the specific uh, money laundering risks associated with uh, equity that you don't know, but you, you need to learn on the job. So you, we you, we can't have you as the head of since you have this such a, a big uh, uh, lack of uh, information for the specific industry. So uh, it, it's important to really aim at an industry you really uh, like because uh, when you specialize yourself at some point it's getting harder and harder to, to change so the next question i have is about the most challenging and rewarding aspect of working as a chief compliance officer would you mind sharing those two parts uh, that um could be good for viewers to know yeah 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 no uh because of course it, it's also a hard job and uh, there are tough aspects about it um, I would say the toughest for me uh, is the, um, not always of course, but the interactions with the business side of things when you are the bad guy, when you have to say no, we cannot onboard this uh, Cyprus based company which is doing, doing online and online advertising for a Russian subsidiary or something with a, with a, with a lawyer on top of it which is not linked to the UBOs and so on. Uh, when you have to say no it's always hard because you are making someone lose some business and it's uh, frustrating. So he, most of the time if you have good communication skills uh, it will it will it will work out because people will understand and they will move on but some Sometimes there is an emotional aspect to it and you need to deal with the, the people's frustration and uh, it's not often when you get I would say better at it but sometimes you have people getting mad uh, and if sometimes you, you get caught in the in the mix you get some, you get mad too and it's a very very bad feeling you know mm -hmm. so uh, I would say this is the toughest but over time uh, you get better at communicating and people don't get that mad if you give them all the cold facts and they, they, they just have to, to accept it. Uh, and I would say uh, it, it's a parallel, but the, the most rewarding thing is actually when the business is, uh, is very happy with your job. Uh, they understand that you are doing the best you can do to enable them, but you are also mitigating the risks of the company in an efficient way, which is very important because no one wants to lose their job uh, and the company needs to keep on uh, keep on operating. So uh, yeah, it's very, uh, it's very rewarding when actually you get praise from the from the business side of things and uh, i would say also it's more linked to the job itself when you uh, when you detect real money laundering or financing of tourism scheme and that you get to actually stop it because you it, it gives sense to uh, meaning to to what we do because this is a uh, this is the, the end goal of our job to just stop the bad guys Thank you for sharing that. And um, which are the key elements that would influence the salary that can be offered to a chief compliance officer? Uh, there are a few. Um, like any job, there is, there is the, your ability to uh, ne negotiate because not, not sure. everyone 
is good at it. And honestly, my advice is go for it. Uh, if you don't ask for it, you will never get it. So uh, if you are doing a good job, if you're getting uh, good feedbacks, then ask for a raise because it looks like you are deserving it. Um, so that's the first thing, of course. Uh, it, it's very rare that people will come to you and say, oh, you deserve a raise and, and give it to you. Usually you, you have to ask. Um, another thing is, of course, the, 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 the sum of your experiences. Um, for example, I had the, uh, the, 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 the chance of, um, I was lucky enough to acquire uh, Imoni Institution license for my previous company. This is something uh, uh, that I put in my CV because I know it has value for other companies. If I've done it once, they know I can do it another time and it's something that 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 is uh, that costs a lot for a company so they, they, they will take this into consideration uh and and basically yeah it, it's all the things you can say you are able to do if you can prove you are able to uh, interact efficiently with the engineers uh, it will have value if uh, you have experience with managing uh, uh, like a uh, medium or big uh, big size team it will have value too uh, and i think uh, it also depends on the size of the company because if you are in a big company it's easier to get a, a good salary but if you go to the very early stage startup you will have maybe a lower salary but there is a good chance that you will get uh, equity from the company so uh, over time it can be more interesting than, than the salary so this is something to to also consider uh, and last thing uh, definitely the industry uh, some industries have more money than others and it will definitely uh, impact the salary that the different companies can offer to you Amazing, that's uh, super useful. Thank you, Baptiste. We have another couple of questions, Baptiste, and the one I wanted to ask you now is that being the compliance chief compliance officer, it's a great privilege and at the same time, a very important position with a lot of responsibility. Is there a trend or a tendency that is showing what chief compliance officers are doing next in their career after moving on uh, from this position? I have one example, so we, we cannot call that a tendency, but I, 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 it definitely works. Uh, I've seen a former chief compliance officer uh, working as a um, uh, chief uh, commercial officer at a compliance tool uh, company. Because in the end, you know exactly the needs of a bank or a, a fintech or any uh, any financial uh, services. So uh, you are an asset for a compliance tool uh, company because you you will you will speak the same language as the person you are actually selling the tool to. So uh, uh, if you have this commercial this sales uh, fiber in you, I, it can definitely work. Personally, I. Uh, I did not think about the, the next move uh, yet, so I cannot tell you, but uh, maybe sales, who knows. Okay, thank you. And uh, we are at the end of the interview. So lastly, if uh, people from the audience would like to get in touch with you, what's the best way to contact you? So it's definitely LinkedIn. Uh, I'm quite active on the on the network. Uh, I try to post uh, on a weekly basis uh, money laundering techniques. So uh, I, I try to explain how they work, uh, what are the risks, what are the red flags. So it's uh, it's quite high level. So uh, people that uh, criminals they cannot leverage this to do uh, wrong things. But for people who are working within the industry, sometimes it can it can just be interesting and give you some more uh, additional information that, uh, that can always help. Uh, and uh, I also have a newsletter uh, about money, money laundering techniques too. Uh, it's, uh, it's a monthly uh, occurrence and uh, you can find it uh, of course also on LinkedIn. And uh, but this is uh, still a work uh, in progress, but it will come, uh, come out uh, at some point. I'm uh, like you uh, preparing a, a podcast uh, it's a slightly, uh, slightly different uh, format in terms of questions and so on. Uh, but uh, I've been inspired actually by, by, your, by your work uh, and thank others you. all working uh, within the compliance industry. And uh, thanks to LinkedIn, I, I had the opportunity to discuss with people with backgrounds that are just 
crazy interesting uh, like a supreme court judge uh, like a ccos of big banks and, uh, and and actually they they are willing to discuss about their job so i think it can it can be very interesting uh, episodes too so the the work the work title at this moment is the the laundromat and uh, let's see how it goes but uh, i aim at doing the first episode by the end of september so uh, i will keep you posted uh, on this yeah and of course for those watching the video you will find some links to get in touch with baptiste in the video description right below and i want to thank you baptiste for accepting to speak on my channel it was a, a truly a great pleasure to have you and i hope we can chat again in the near future with more insights and industry updates from your end yeah i, I would love that and uh, thank you very much it was a, a very smooth interview and uh, i really enjoyed it Perfect. Thank you again and have a good day. Thanks, you too. We are at the end of this video. If my content was useful to you, press the thumb up and leave your feedback using the comment section down below. And lastly, thank you for watching. I hope you have enjoyed this video and until next time, see you soon.